John? Yeah, let me share my screen first. I, I'll introduce you real briefly, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Can I share my slide? Yeah, share slides. Yeah, I'm excited to welcome everyone here to this session. Um, where Dr. Jerry who is presenting on facial recognition, machine learning, and marketing. Dr. Jerry is an assistant professor of marketing at Governor State University in the College of Business here. He joined us in 2017. I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting time. We're going to learn a lot of new things. And we're going to give, a, give an allowance for 10 minutes at the end of the session for Dr. Jang to answer your questions. So please um, post them and I'll be taking notes. And like I said, at the end of, of the session, he'll, you know, he'll answer your questions. So Dr. Jang, over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining my session. Uh, as I uh, only introduced, uh, my name is Sean Jang. I'm an assistant professor of marketing uh, in the College of Business. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about facial recognition, machine learning, and marketing. So these days, many companies like Facebook, Apple, or Google, they use facial recognition tools in their businesses. Can you think of any example of facial recognition services in your daily life? Yeah, one of the most common experiences would be on Facebook. You might have found that when you upload a photo you have taken with your friend, Facebook recognizes the faces of your friends and automatically tags your friend. If you have a recent version of a smartphone, you know you can unlock your phone through facial recognition. You can also use it when you buy them. Buy them. China is actually very advanced in this field. Alibaba's subsidiary Alipay was the very first to use facial recognition with its payment service. This was in 2017, three years ago. Now in China, more than a hundred million people have signed up for this service. However, until very recently, we haven't seen anything like this in the US. In the US, a startup company called Pop ID has introduced similar services to the US. This company is testing this service in LA now and plans to roll it out in other cities. All of these facial recognition services have been made possible due to significant improvements to machine learning. I'm now using a virtual background. This is also possible because Zoom can recognize my silhouette. Whether we are aware of it or not, we are now getting flooded with the facial recognition services and more broadly with machine learning techniques. What do you know about machine learning? I believe many of you have heard of AlphaGo or deep learning. Deep learning is one type of machine learning. If you have heard of AlphaGo, it might very well have been March 2016, only four years ago. It's because in March 2016, there was a very famous match between AlphaGo and Sadoli, who was the world's champion of the game Go. 
AlphaGo and Seto Lee had five games, and AlphaGo won four games. Seto Lee only won one game, but he is the only human who has ever beaten AlphaGo. Officially, AlphaGo has played in 74 games, winning all except for one game, which was won by Seto Lee. Anyway, after that match, people started to worry about the potential threat of AI. A lot of news articles said lots of people would lose their jobs because of AI. Suddenly, might actually have been the first one to lose his job to AI. Three years after the match against AlphaGo, he retired. In an interview, he said that the match with AlphaGo was the main reason for his decision to retire early. Before he played a match, he was well respected as a goal game master. If he ever made a mistake, people thought there must have been a good reason for the move and that they just didn't understand what it was. However, after the match, while he was playing, people would run an AI machine program. And if he said the move was not right, they would tell him it was not the best move. As a result, he no longer finds value in playing the game goal. Sadly, always said that Hunyan Jo was his role model. Hunyan Jo was the world's best player when Sadly was five years old and just starting to learn the game go. Jo retired when Jo was 63 years old. He was very popular in Korea and was able to move on to becoming a lawmaker. If AlphaGo had not been invented in the lifetime of Sadly, he also could have played until he reached the age of 60. What about us? Are we safe? in the face of the AI invasion. When Sadoli played against AlphaGo, I was a PhD student. I was only worried about my dissertation. One year later, fortunately, I earned my PhD and got a job here at GSU but I still didn't have any interest in AI or machine learning. And how did I first come in contact with machine learning? That was because of this research paper. At the time, one of my research projects examined the influence of facial expressions on a website to amounts donated to needy kids. Prior research had shown that people tend to donate more money to sad-faced children. However, I thought the pattern would be different when people made decisions to sponsor a child as opposed to make a one-time donation. Sponsoring a child entailed monthly donations through a children's charity and then corresponding with the child by sending and receiving letters and photos. I conducted multiple experiments and found that consistent with the prior research in the context of one-time donations, participants donated more money to sad-faced children than to happy-faced children. However, when participants in an experimental setting were asked to choose a child to sponsor they chose happy-faced children more frequently than sad-faced children. 
I wanted to test it if the same would be true for people actually accessing children charities website. So I next try to check actual data from children's charities. I contacted multiple children's charities. It took a year to obtain a license agreement with a children's charity. Now I collaborate with one of the largest international children's charities that sponsored about 2 million needy children. My plan was to analyze facial expression of 10,000 children. How can I do that? I didn't have any time or resources to do everything manually. That was the moment when I got interested in machine learning. I needed machines to figure out certain things. I had to learn the Python programming language and how to use facial recognition techniques. However, this new learning helped me open a new research area. Now I'm also uh, analyzing photos on Airbnb listings. Using machine learning models, I can analyze various features on Airbnb host photos that machine learning models can uh, extract, such as emotions, head position, facial hair, age, and so on. Then I examine the relationship between those features and star guest ratings. Today, I'm not going to tell you about my research in details. Maybe later, I hope to have another chance to share my research in more detail. Services that we see today simply work by recognizing your face. However, the face can tell you a whole lot more about a person than their identity. I'm going to share some past research on what kind of information faces can be built. One paper shared in the journal Science showed that faces can predict outcomes of political elections. Two researchers at Princeton University conducted some experiment. They showed the participants pairs of photos of two candidates for the U.S. Senate. One is the winner and the other one is the runner-up. Participants were asked to indicate which person is the more competent. If a participant recognized any of the faces, their responses were not used in the analysis. The results show that the candidates who were perceived to be more competent won 71.6% of the Senate races. Researchers at Duke University did a similar study on CEOs. They showed participants pairs of CEOs one was the CEO of a small company, and the other was the CEO of a large company. Participants were asked to indicate who was more competent, trustworthy, likable, and attractive. Perceived competency predicted the CEO of the large company. These studies let us know that what kind of predict, uh, predictions we can make based only on faces. Let's do a similar experiment ourselves. These are two people who were candidates for a political election in Korea. And by the way, I, uh, for your information, I'm Korean. And think about who you think is the more competent. Yeah, I'm not going to formally ask you this question and collect your responses but just think about it. 
And I'm going to show you the correct answer on the next slide. Yeah, actually, B was the correct answer. His name is Myungbak Lee. President Lee was the president of Korea from 2008 to 2013. So I don't know what, uh, how you answered, but yeah, I hope uh, the responses here, yeah, was the consistent with the prior research. Then the next question, can faces predict even how smart you are? The research I'm going to share on the next slide says yes. Researchers at the University of Cambridge recruited Facebook users. They then had those Facebook users take an IQ test. They use these test scores as measured intelligence. The researchers also obtain the profile photos of those users. They then show those photos to other people. And those other people rated how smart each Facebook user looked. These ratings on smartness were used as perceived intelligence. They found that perceived intelligence was significantly correlated with measured intelligence. This means that someone who looks smart may actually be smart. <laughs> they uh, extracted various facial features and then train the model using machine learning. They had a machine learned model estimate the perceived intelligence of each Facebook user. They found that these estimates were significantly correlated with the perceived intelligence as rated by humans. This means that this trained model was able to predict what observers looking at your Facebook profile photo would perceive when asked to estimate your smartness. This model was even able to predict actual IQ scores just by looking at photos. This is incredible. So if you don't want to reveal your IQ score, you have to hide your face from these machines. Okay, now let me tell you about how machines learn. We can learn everything about how machine learning works in this short video, but briefly knowing about it will help us to be somewhat prepared. Let's say you want to teach a computer to be able to tell you the difference between images of dogs and cats. You prepare photos of dogs and cats and correct answers identifying which is which. Then you simply train the machine by showing it those pictures of cats and dogs and the correct answers for each photo. Humans also need to spend so much time to prepare the teaching materials needed. Thousands to millions of images are used to train machines. This means some humans had to label millions of images manually before training machines. Of course, once we train machines, machines will be able to label billions of images automatically for us. However, I wanted to tell you it is not that machines automatically learn something without any help from humans. Then even when the computer is shown new photos, it will be able to categorize those photos as cats or dogs automatically. Okay, then 
how does a computer see or perceive an image? You know, computers perceive everything in numbers. Images are also expressed in numbers in their brain, and computers will only understand these numbers. So a single digit in black and white is simpler than a color cap image. So I'm going to use a digit as an example from now. Actually, machine learning research first started to try to read numbers. So now the goal of training machines is to make them give the correct answer to us when they receive an image expressed in numbers. So all the models use templates for each number. They then compare the input digit with each of the templates to find the most similar one as the correct answer. So this algorithm found the A uh, template is the most similar to the input digit. However, those templates don't work well when the position of a digit is very different from the positions in the template. People had to create additional templates for each of these cases. This means they had to prepare so many templates to respond to all possible cases. This method was not practical. To be useful in our daily lives, machines should be able to recognize all these handwritten numbers. However, researchers didn't know how to address this. A significant improvement took place when computer scientists turned their attention to how animal and human eyes work. In the 1960s, Hubble and Weasel made a significant contribution to understanding how animals' brains understand images. Hubble and Vigil later received a Nobel Prize. The most surprising finding was the fact that the visual system consists of multiple layers. Also, the first layer recognizes very simple things, whereas the later layer can understand complex things. Let me explain it with a simple example. When we see a number four, the neurons in the first layer detect only simple shapes. For example, this neuron only detects horizontal lines. The second one detects vertical lines. This one detects angles greater than 40 degrees and less than 50 degrees. The last one detects angles of greater than 310 degrees and less than 320 degrees. The neurons then return information such as whether that particular shape exists to the next layer. So in this example, the first three neurons will be activated and return yes to the next layer. If the digit were seven, only the first and third neurons would be activated. The neurons in the second layer are connected to some neurons in the first layer. They receive information from the first layer and some of them are activated and give information to the next layer. In this example, 
in, um, in this way, animals and humans perceive an image. So this is the basic concept of how the animals and human uh, visual system work. In 1980, Fukushima first applied the Hubble and visual findings to his model called uh, Neocognitron. So you can see uh, his model has multiple layers. This uh, illustrates how Fukushima's model perceives an A. This model um, has multiple layers, and the first layer detects simpler uh, features and delivers the information to the next layer. And finally, the last uh, layer uh, will recognize an A layer. A uh, young Lukun advanced the model and actually made a model that was able to be used in daily life. The model was called a convolutional neural network. Due to this contribution, he became a professor at NYU and the director of AI research at Facebook. Let me show you a video showing how his initial model worked. So this uh, video originally doesn't have a sound, so. So yeah, um, so we saw like his model actually uh, worked well, but this uh, this computer is a 486 PC. So such an old PC was able to read handwritten numbers, even like 1990. So if you look at uh, this figure, how his CNA model worked was very similar to how Fukushima's mod uh, model worked. Various features of the number six were detected by separate feature extraction neurons. Then in a lay uh, later layer, those features aggregately determine that only the number six has all the identified features, although other numbers like three, five, or eight uh, have some of the detected features. This is the structure of Yan Li Kun's CNN model. The number of parameters was 60,000 in 1998. So this is the reason why so many images are needed to train machines. So now you, know, you can see his CNN is able to return the correct answer, uh, which is number four and uh, is the answer, although uh, this number is currently moving. Although there is uh, some noise or distortion of the number, 
this uh, CNN model still can detect those numbers very accurately. It can also read even multiple moving digits. So if you're looking at the 21 example, you know, while the number one moving uh, at the certain point, it looks like number four. But after that, uh, it accurately read uh, as 21. So 12, four, and 21. So now we can see uh, his model works very well. So after looking at uh, the CNN model, machines were able to read the numbers, but there was still a long way to go in order for machines to understand colorful images. This would require a lot more photos for training and much more advanced GPU graphic card. So 12 years later, in 2010, those requirements seem to be met. So researchers started to collaborate more actively to advance image recognition techniques. ImageNet Challenge, an international competition on image recognition, has made a significant contribution to the development of image recognition research. The task in the challenge was to assign one of a thousand category labels to a given image. For example, the machines uh, have to assign labels like these. So labels need to be very specific. When machines see an image of a cat, they need to also figure out the type of cat, if it is an Egyptian cat or Persian or um, Siamese cat. So Stanford students were asked to perform the same categorization task to be compared to the capability of machine learning. The students were trained with hundreds of images and completed the same task. Their error rate ranged from 5 to 12 percent, so it means it's not an easy test even for people. They had a first competition in uh, 2010. Can you guess the error rate for the first year? As I said, the human error rate was between 5 and 12 percent. for machine learning, it was 28.2%. So actually that, this one's not very good. Next year, there was not much improvement. However, in 2012, a significant improvement was made. The error rate was reduced to 16.4%, which is huge. The winning model used the Likun's CNN model. Since then, all models in subsequent years were based on the CNN model. The number of layers increased from eight layers in 2012 to 269 layers in 2006. In 2016, the machine learning error rate was below the human error rate. Thus, there was no competition after 2017 because the task was no longer challenged. Okay, so I think I told you all the basic concepts of machine learning. So beyond simply uh, recognizing what's in an image. As I said earlier, machine learning can read facial expressions of emotion and extract other specific features from faces. 
So what researchers are doing right now, so they are now trying to teach machines how to figure out a situation happening in an image. For example, from this image, for now, a machine can only tell us the image contains a car or an arm of a person and smoke, but, but they can't tell us yet that the car had a car accident. So this is all that I have prepared for today's session. So I hope you have a better understanding of machine learning than before. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Jang. And if you have any questions, please post them. Or you, or you will raise your hand. And if you're given the, um, the right to, you know, ask him directly. Dr. Zhang, I have a question about the balancing personal privacy uh, mm -hmm. with the advancement of facial recognition technology. We know that in some countries like China, they use facial recognition, like you said, they're very much more advanced. They use those uh, technology um, to identify uh, fugitives, criminals, and, you know, um, but people there don't seem to care that much about, you know, their faces being in a huge database and being used. Um, they scan their face when they go to uh, take a train, um, you know, so how do, how do we balance that? Um, there's, there's benefit of recognizing having that technology, but I think in countries like the US, people are much more uh, fearful or are, you know, concerned about that. Yeah, so, yeah, actually, uh, that's a um, yeah, very uh, valid question. And then, yeah, that's a very uh, issue these days. So actually, that's why the China is a very advanced stage in this field, whereas the, in the US, kind of is lag behind. So because the American people more care about privacy. So, and then recently, you might have uh, seen a news article about the Amazon or Google, Facebook, they stopped selling that technology to the government because they worry that um, about how the US government use that technology when they um, detect some criminals. So they think that their privacy or human rights were not protected well, so they stopped selling. So actually, um, it's very complicated. So as a business professor, I kind of stopped thinking about that. But uh, I believe that um, there could be some uh, the law to protect those things. Because if you think about like credit cards, actually, um, maybe I'm not sure, but there could be some worry before uh, starting to use credit card. Because if you your card is stolen, then people would worry that, okay, so everybody can use your money. And then even when you pay, you give credit card to somebody you don't know, they actually still can take a photo of the credit card very quickly, or even um, your social card or those things. But because we have law uh, just preventing them from doing that, so we are like live safely. So I guess we need some time for like, authorities to prepare the relevant load. So finally, even if the cameras can like take photos of our faces, but if we had load, then I believe we will just be in a place safely can do it. That's very interesting, Dr. Jack. So let me, let me follow up on, on that question. So what are some of the commercial applications for facial recognition? I mean, how do you see them being used now and in the near future. Yeah, so as it's uh, like showed uh, already be uh, using facial recognition, mainly uh, they're used um, like for um, kind of like detecting your um, like ID and identity, right? So you can pay uh, without just physically uh, like pulling out my credit card and giving to you, but just by showing my faces, I can pay. But later, um, I showed this, those uh, past research, like um, the faces can tell us how competent you are or how trusty you are. So I guess this can be applied to some marketing tools. So one of the, actually the 
the as I said, China is very advanced. So the most um, like leading company in the facial recognition field is a Chinese company, and their kind of recent service is reading, uh, giving us a beauty score. So if I show my faces, then they kind of estimate um, how other people think about my beauty. So actually they can be uh, used a, um, some app for now for just fun pur purposes. But I also read some papers about like what's the beauty and then beauty, the definition of beauty different across country. So actually in Korea, we have uh, a lot of people do plastic surgeries right. and then they have papers are in that field and then they interest in that topic, what's the beauty in this particular country because when they consult their clients and patients, they need to give some direction, change your face like this. So I don't know, that will also cause some ethical issues, but anyway, I guess um, that, that will open a lot of uh, opportunity for business. Dr. Ujwala has her hand raised. You're muted. Yeah, you just touched upon the question that was uppermost on my mind. I wanted to ask you what role do you think machine learning and facial recognition might play in reinforcing harmful stereotypes, particularly in an age when we are trying to dismantle stereotypes? So for instance, if uh, the people who are doing the labeling sort of label a fair-skinned person as being beautiful and then the machine learns that fair skin equals beauty, then you are inadvertently reinforcing a stereotype that the world is working very hard to dismantle. So uh, I just wanted to know your uh, opinion and your reactions to that possibility. Yeah, actually, yeah, that uh, caused a lot of like ethical issues. And then um, there is one of a uh, paper from MIT and then the researcher found that so the machine are not good at uh, recognizing faces of colored people or the female people. The reason is they, um, maybe I guess the male, uh, the photos of male people are more and more available. So they use the male people when they train. So actually they could be some like limitation. Maybe if the Chinese company, they use the photos of Chinese people then to be biased when they define the beauty of people more toward the, the preferences for uh, old Chinese people. So I think that uh, could be some kind of goal for the, those machine learning companies to address. So always like depending on what kind of data they use when they train, there could be some bias in that model. So let, let me ask a follow-up question to what you spoke about a couple of minutes ago about plastic surgery. So if I'm not really very smart, but I figure out that you know, if I look a certain way, but you know, the, you know, the, the technology will enable me as smart and I apply for a job and I do, you know, I do some surgery and you know, the company thinks I'm really very smart. So as the company has some follow-on interviews, but to figure out whether I'm really, really, really smart, I could get the job, but I'm gonna find out I'm not that smart. You know, the company has a cut cost. You know, the cost of recruiting, the cost of training me. You know, just based on the, you know, you know, some machine telling them that you know what, this face looks smart, right? So, um, how do you prevent you know gaming, right? So people might want to game the system. That's just an example that could be other ways that people come at you know to game the system to create a perception of themselves that's not accurate. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, again, like, I hope there could be a like efficient law to you know, make this everything work efficiently and helpful for everybody. But <clears throat> just I, um, actually the, in Korea, many people like even male uh, applicants, they do plastic surgery. That's not common, but to get a job. So if, uh, and then so, 
in the US, in resume, we don't put our photos on resume. But in Korea, I guess they changed the rule, I guess, right now. So only many people don't ask applicants to put their photos on the resume. But in the past, we did. So actually, that uh, caused some like discrimination. So, but anyway, for that reason, some people were willing to do plastic surgery. And then from that paper, one interesting thing that I remember was the glasses, wearing glasses is one thing that not actually correlate with the how smart you actually are, but uh, when you glass, uh, wear glasses, people perceive you be smart. So yeah, so except for June, if we are wear glasses, <laughs> kind of like good <laughs> strategy to like work as a professor. I remember there was another thing about my time glasses and there's another thing. Mm -hmm. Just not actually correlate with a third smart list, but just correlate with perceived the intelligence. Uh, there's, uh, there's a question here. Oh, Dr. Jan. A, and also Rita also raised her, her hand. It's about uh, law enforcement. So Sean, uh, can you see the question posted in Q&A or do you yeah. want to read it to uh, Enforcement. Recently, there was a case where someone was inappropriately subjected to based on inaccurate facial recognition speak to the efficiency of the Yeah, as I said, that's why uh, the companies like Google and Amazon, they stopped selling uh, that technology to the government. And then because I uh, used that technology by myself, so I, I know that's not very efficient because sometimes they, uh, I ran like a thousand or million, not million, but 10,000 photos. And sometimes um, the machine uh, model says there's a microwave, but actually there was a just desk, office desk. Or there is a just pet, but they say um, the, the bad face or person. So, I know it's not perfect, but uh, because they deal with so many images. So even like a 0.1% is huge to the specific people, but like in terms of efficient, they still work. So I guess still it's not perfect uh, techniques. So it should be complemented other like things. And then uh, I'm uh, reading the second question. What are your potential research ideas or topics that you are currently working on other than donation activities using that, uh, this technique? Yeah, so as I briefly told you, the Airbnb listing here, um, the topic that I'm working on. So as I said, uh, actually machine uh, learning models can extract uh, various features from uh, food spaces. So actually, um, I found the facial, uh, the happy, as you expected, like happy face posts, they got a uh, higher guest rating. And then one finding that I didn't expect was uh, they also measure the head position, like this is heat or just angle like this. And then I found that the hosts had uh, a high peak, means they uh, looked at the camera like this, and then they had lower um, guest rating. So I guess um, I found I found from the psychology uh, field, some paper did an experiment and found that if when somebody is looking at you like this, then they people think that you are arrogant. So they tend to not evaluate you well. So and another uh, research stream is I also compare. Uh, these features across different countries. So I looked at the data in uh, the New York City and then compared that data to data in China, in China, in China. And then one of the findings uh, was in the US, uh, the posting uh, your photos as an Airbnb host is very important. If you don't post your photos, then uh, on average, your guest rating is expected to be low. Mm. But in China, actually that didn't matter a lot. I guess as a Korean, as an Asian, maybe 
we don't care a lot um, because we know we don't want to like show ourselves. So we don't want to stand out. So maybe that's the culture that even if you didn't post a photo, but still, even in China, the happy face post uh, got greater get rain. So I'm still working on various topics. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jang. Um, I'm not sure if there are any more questions. You know, we're, touch, we're touching four o'clock when we're supposed to end the session. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Jang. Thank you. That was very, very interesting. Very interesting. This is, is indeed fascinating. Uh, I just want to quickly mention that tomorrow, uh, starting at two o'clock, we have our virtual career and internship fair. Again, 10 companies will be there to meet with our students and alumni. Uh, in one-on-one -on -one virtual session. Um, so please do uh, register on the platform. Um, and then six o'clock, we'll have our closing keynote and the um, College of Business Alumni Hall of Achievement. Um, so we're looking forward to see you there uh, tomorrow too. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Utbala. Thank you, Sean. Wonderful presentation. All right, have a rest of your afternoon. Enjoy the weather. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Bye bye. All right. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Uh, that was so cool, Sean. Uh. <laughs> Thank you.